Let us take a look of some easier but weaker bounds. So we are still looking at the random variable, which is the sum of n independent Poisson trials. And then we have the same parameters, such that the jth trial succeeds with probability pj, and the mean value mu is equal to the expected of this x. Okay. So the first bound that we have for the right tail is, suppose that delta is a small value between 0 and 1, the probability of x greater than or equal to 1 plus delta times mu will be less than or equal to e to the power minus mu delta squared over 3. Now notice that for the original bound, there is no limitation of this delta, so the delta could be very large, but here we restrict that delta has to be between 0 and 1. But on the other hand, the bound that we have here is much easier to remember. It is just if you imagine that you need to use a calculator, if someone tells you the value of delta, someone tells you the value of mu, if you need to use a calculator, then this bound is easier to obtain than the previous bound, which looks like e to the power delta, and then divided by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta, and this whole term to the power mu. So this is a much easier to see, much easier to remember bound. And then we have another case. This case is when this value, the value that x is compared to, is super large. If it is larger than or equal to 6 times mu, then the bound you can use 2 to the power minus r to represent it. Okay, so let's see why this is correct. Okay, so we have the first bound. So for the first bound, it is sufficient if we can show this one, e to the power delta divided by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta, is less than or equal to e to the power minus delta square over 3. To get this, okay, it is the same as if we are showing that the log of the left-hand side is less than or equal to the log of the right-hand side. And equivalently, this is the log of the left-hand side. And then this is minus the log of the right-hand side. So if equivalently, we want to show that the log of the left-hand side minus the log of the right-hand side is less than or equal to zero. So let's call this function the function of delta. We want to show that this is true when delta holds for the case in the first bound, which is delta between zero and one. Okay, so again as before, when we want to analyze a function, it is good to take a look of the first derivative and also the second derivative. Now from the second derivative, we will see that by setting delta to be 0 and delta to be 1, we will see that the value of the second derivative first starts with some negative value, and then later it becomes positive. So what does it mean? So from this one, it means that f prime delta, this function first decreases, and then increases in this range of delta between 0 and 1. So f prime first decreases and then increases. So this is f prime. Okay, now when f prime first decreases, and then we see that f prime 0 is actually equal to 0, and f prime 1 is, equal, is less than 0, so it first decreases from 0, and then go to some small value, and then go up, but then it is still negative. So it implies what? It implies that the slope of f is always either 0 or negative. So f delta is monotonically decreasing. So if f delta decreases, then it means that the leftmost endpoint, f0, will be the maximum value. But f0, it is equal to 0. So it means that what? It means that for the function of f, then it is decreasing from 0. So in that case, we are done. It is because what we want to show. We want to show that f delta is less than or equal to 0. So f delta is less than or equal to f of 0, and f of 0 is equal to 0, so f of delta is less than or equal to 0. For all the range of delta that we consider. So we have the, the result of the first bound. Now for the second bound, for the second bound, we rely on the original formula, original bound, this e delta divided by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta. 
So what we are going to do here is we set R to be 1 plus delta mu. And by setting R to be 1 plus delta mu, recall that R in our second bound, this is our second bound, we set R to be 1 plus delta this value times mu. So it means that the delta that we are looking at is at least 5. Or the 1 plus delta value is at least 6. Is that okay? So by setting R to be 1 plus delta mu, then this term, original bound, E delta divided by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta to the power mu, we first find out that we can make it smaller than or equal to if we make this e to the power larger, we multiply an extra e to it, so it becomes e to the power 1 plus delta instead. Now, because we have e to the power 1 plus delta, we have 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta, so we can take out the 1 plus delta to the outside, so that 1 plus delta now is multiplied by mu. But 1 plus delta, when it is multiplied by mu, we get r. Is that okay? So this whole term, is the same as this term because 1 plus delta can be taken out and 1 plus delta times mu is equal to r. But now since 1 plus delta is at least 6 but e is the base of the natural log which is only 2.7. So this value divided by 6 is less than or equal to 1 over 2. So that's why we get 2 to the power minus r here. So this is another bound. So this bound works when the value of R that we see is super large. Okay, and the first bound works when the value of delta that we see is super small. So we have two bounds for the for the right tail. Okay, now let us take a look of the left tail. For the left tail, we have a bound that is similar to the to the right tail first bound. So here for delta which is small, between 0 and 1, then the probability of x less than or equal to 1 minus delta times mu will be less than or equal to e to the power minus mu delta square. Now, this is divided by 2 here. So again, we can prove this using a similar strategy. What we are going to do here is we take out the original bound in the normal case, in the original form, the tighter form, and we show that this value is less than or equal to this value. And to show this is true, as before, we want to show the log of the left-hand side is less than or equal to the log of the right-hand side. Or equivalently, we want to show that the log of the left-hand side, so this is this part, minus the log of the right-hand side is less than or equal to 0. So we want to show that this function g delta is less than or equal to 0 in the range delta between 0 and 1 that we are considering. So this is g, so we can do differentiation to get g prime, we can also get g double prime. Now this time it is much easier, so if you look at g double prime, g double prime is always negative. So if g double prime is always negative, then that means that g prime is decreasing. So when g prime is decreasing, the maximum value of g prime will be g, g prime zero, okay? So g prime 0 is equal to 0, and all the values after that will be decreasing. So that, so that what? So that it implies that g, the function of g is decreasing. So g prime is either 0 or negative, so g is decreasing. Now if g is decreasing, the maximum value will be on the leftmost endpoints, so g0 will be the maximum value. g0 turns out to be 0, so 0 is the maximum value of g delta. And in the end, we get the same conclusion that all the values of g delta that we consider is less than or equal to zero. So this is the end of the weaker bounds.